Okay. So my name is Dr. Chu. I'm from the plastic surgery department. I basically help uh, Dr. Emil and the cancer surgeons to restore function and to help them get back to their feet, you know, as early as possible. I come from a more functional and uh, cosmetic point of view. So I'm interested in having less scar. I work in a burn center. So you can imagine all our fire burns victims, they do get a lot of scars. So they, the scar itself can limit their lifespan. They get depressed. They get pain all the time. So I have a vested interest in avoiding big, big scars. So if you come in with scars and you get keloid scars, for example, those that grow and grow, it can be very painful. So um, this robot technology is now available to even plastic surgeons like us, and I'll go to a bit more detail. Like. Yeah, so my priority is to restore form and function. And this slide summarizes why we're here today. Basically, we have about 41,000 people uh, males and 42,000 females uh, developing cancers over the last five years. And average number of new cancers per day is about 22, 23 cases. You know? And of course, the, the age at diagnosis is usually in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh. And fortunately, um, with good treatment, the survival rate can improve with time. And why is it that cancer is so feared? Not because of the disease itself, but basically, Cancer operations, especially those that change how the patient look, feel, function, will have significant implication on the quality of life. It's not about living longer. If you live longer but you suffer all these years, it is worse than if you live shorter, yet you have your full function, you're able to be uh, uh, yourself, to help your family, to not be a burden to your loved one. I think that is more important for Singaporeans. And other cancer treatment, there is another level of healing, you know, not just physical, but mental. And you, you need skilled reconstructive surgery, for example, for scar treatment, uh, for functional problems. So this is where we want to tell people. So cancer, of course, is still the number one problem in Singapore. It kills the most number of people. And then, of course, top 10 cancers, especially in Singapore context, for guys, is colon, colon cancer. For ladies, colon and lung cancer. And um, early detection will improve survival rate. So you can see, starting from the 70s to now 2021, the five-year survival, we measure cancer survival in five years. So let's say you have cancer today, five years later you're alive, that means you have survived cancer. You can see it's improved uh, from generally less than 20% to today, 60, 70, and even more. Uh, besides the improvement in treatment, we detect cancer early, we have more awareness people are aware that they need to understand that there is this thing called cancer and you can screen early. And that's what we have these public forums for. And of course, among all the cancers, different cancers will give you different uh, 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 life expectancy. And those cancers, they are deep inside your body, pancreas, lung, liver, stomach. They are less likely to be detected. That's why we need to do screening, colonoscopy, scans, ultrasound. Uh, do not ignore your, your own symptom. You can, of course, lower your risk of cancer with maintaining a healthy diet, physical activity, make sure you maintain a healthy weight, smoke-free lifestyle, avoid excessive alcohol, and of course, screening and follow-up. And even diet, you know, uh, this is from Cancer Society, and if you take a rainbow color of diet, you know, it will help you prevent and reduce the risk of cancers. So, Traditionally, you know, when we do surgery, like open heart surgery, for example, you can see the scar is very big, you know, and a lot of people, even though they have cured their heart problems, they come back with the scars that uh, plague them for the next 20, 30 years. Even a simple caesarean scar can give you a lot of problems because it traps hair, right? And of course, big wounds are required because last time surgeons want to put their hand in and do all this surgery. Nowadays, uh, that's why... Robotic surgery is revolutionizing everything. Even neck surgery, you can see for people who are prone, they can get very bad scars. So this is the diagram that uh, can answer a lot of questions. Basically, you know, when what you do is you put in keyhole, and then of course you can put in air. So the air will separate all the structures for you to see. And this camera will give you a three-dimensional view while you use the other holes to help to perform the surgery. So instead of sticking your hand in, you just stick a very tiny device in. So this is the difference between the open and the closed. So all your muscles, 
they're not affected. Your skin is not affected. Your sensation is not affected. Yeah. So this is how the robot looks like. The patient lies down. The surgeons are not even next to him, right? So we just have these devices with a robot next to it, and we see the screen. And you can even use microscope and things like that to visualize in greater detail. This is a patient's vocal cord, I mean, where they, where they talk. So when you have human, the vocal cord is, you can imagine it's very hard to go inside. So with this robot, it can help. Next surgery, I'm sure, you know, thyroid uh, disease affects very young individuals. Frequently, they are ladies. So when they have this kind of scar, it's almost impossible to hide. And they will be very, very bitter because if you want to wear something that uh, is a bit low, this will always be a problem. Even necklace cannot hide. Right? So in SGH, uh, this is of course courtesy of my friends from ENT. You can do now keyhole robotic and the, and the scar is down in the armpit instead of on the neck. So this is much more acceptable for a lot of patients who you know, have a long and fruitful life in front of them. They don't want this to affect their career and their job prospect. Even for neck surgery, you can hide it behind the hairline and you cannot see a scar there. Uh, nowadays, we are even operating through the mouth to operate into the vocal cords, for example. Yeah. These are all the examples of how robot is helping and how clear we can see individual muscle fibers, nerves. So even if your eyesight is poor, you project it into a big screen, you can avoid injuring all these nerves that cause a lot of pain. Uh, so um, this is an uh, example of how we recreate the tongue. So I will show you the very um, gory photographs. Lah. So this is an example of what I mentioned earlier of how we use the muscle to cover the bottom. So the muscle is taken from the tummy and then it's used to line in a colon cancer patient, this particular type of surgery. So you can see if I cut a big hole here, then this will more be very painful. So but if I can come from inside, take the muscle and uh, put it underneath and reconstruct whatever it needs to be reconstructed. This will give you a much better outcome because otherwise you will end up with two very big incisions. And this is a, this is a video that we have speed up. And this is looking from underneath the patient to up towards the belly button. Uh, so we put a keyhole through the belly button and then from the belly button, we can actually just harvest the muscle uh, and all these are done without a cut on the external surface. The only cut we need is to be need skin on the, on the tummy itself. And this can be done in a much faster, less invasive, less painful manner. So there are many, many advances in the horizon. For example, breast cancer, Dr. Sarita will share with you, we need to do very fine microsurgery that is even beyond the current scope of this kind of robot. Uh, so this one, will be shared with you by Dr. Sabita later. And this is this is the example of how a small the robot can be now. And this is a one millimeter blood vessel. So for me as a surgeon that will grow older, you know, we are always worried after I reach 60 years old, my eyesight is poor, I, my hands shaking. So robot again gives us experienced senior surgeons the ability to perform this surgery without hand shaking. You know, sometimes you go to see a very senior surgeon, you want their experience, but you're worried that, you know, don't know whether his hand can make it, right? So to me, that is also advantageous. So in the future, senior experienced surgeons can continue to perform this kind of advanced surgeries. And this is how it looks like. And we are very proud to be the first country in Asia to be able to get this. So I think I, wish, I shall end here. Um, if there's any questions, we can take about five minutes. Otherwise, I will invite Dr. Savita to come up and set up the talk. Any question? Come. So, the Da Vinci, the da Vinci surgical, surgical system, system is the is most. The most so, Dr. Savita is my very helpful and very competent colleague from KK Women's and Children's Hospital. We are seeing a lot more breast cancer nowadays, not because cancers are increasing, but rather we are catching the cancers at a very early age. Uh, our youngest patients for breast cancer can be as early as 25, 26 years old, you know, and this can be a very devastating uh, uh, cancer for someone who's young, 
who is not yet married, who is trying to make a career for her. So this can sometimes be a big impact on their uh, mental health. And Dr. Savita is a breast surgeon. She's trained in doing breast cancer surgery, as well as making the patient feel good about having a new breast created for them. So it may sound like science fiction that we can now make a new breast, but it's actually not that difficult. And as a plastic surgeon, we understand, you know, if you replace the fat inside the breast, you can make a new uh, breast that looks and feels almost like a normal breast. So uh, without further ado, may I invite Dr. Servita to give us a short talk on uh, breast cancer and reconstruction. Thank you. So, thank you, uh, Dr. Chu. Thank you, everyone, for being here this morning You know, um, and joining us for this uh, forum. And thank you to the organizers and the speakers before me for the kind invitation to share um, uh, to share to 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 share share a little bit about um minimally invasive surgery for breast cancer and reconstruction. Please move the window. Apologize some technical difficulties. So um as Dr. Chu mentioned, uh, I'm actually a plastic and reconstructive surgeon. Uh, my focus is actually uh, I I uh, as a plastic and reconstructive surgeon, my focus is actually in breast reconstruction. Um. I have uh, I, I work closely with the breast cancer surgeons, so I don't do the breast cancer resection myself. But um, as uh, was mentioned before, uh, technology is advancing, and uh, robotic uh, and minimally invasive uh, surgical options are becoming available for uh, cancer surgery. So likewise for breast cancer, this is also becoming something that uh, is um, uh, becoming increasingly available as an option for patients. And so as a plastic and reconstructive surgeon, uh, we too are now um, uh, beginning to um, walk along with the breast surgeons and with the patients on this journey. So um, the objectives of my talk, can we, is that, is that uh, projecting on? Sorry. Just give us one second. So um, hopefully you can see this slide. So the objective of my talk today is to just oh, give an overview of the current uh, breast cancer statistics here in Singapore. And, and, and then just to bring about awareness to what are the minimally invasive uh, surgical options for breast cancer and reconstruction. So breast cancer um, is actually the most common cancer for women in Singapore. Uh, one in 11 women are affected, the majority of them being between the ages 40 to 60. Um, majority of them don't actually have any predisposing or genetic uh, risk factors, actually. So most of them just happen what we call idiopathically um, for, for, uh, in terms of breast cancer. Uh, we are very fortunate here in Singapore to have a very successful breast screening program that was started in 2002. And because of this breast screening program, um, the uh, majority of the cancers that are diagnosed here in Singapore are actually early cancers. So what does that mean? That actually means that most of our patients, even though they are diagnosed with breast cancer, mm -hmm. have a very, very good outcome and very, very um, high uh, chance of full recovery. And thanks to increased you know, advancements in uh, medical technology and uh, uh, pharmacology, now with uh, improved surgical techniques, uh, detection, surgical technique, um, me medical treatment in the form of chemotherapy, targeted therapy, and radiotherapy. Overall, for breast cancer, survival oh, yeah. rates are improving. And because it's a public forum, I just want to, again, bring, bring attention to, to the breast screen program and for anyone who is interested in this monitor. Um, there's some information here about breast screen Singapore. So um, because of the improved overall survival rate for breast cancer, uh, as we treat breast cancer now, the management concept has shifted towards thinking about breast cancer beyond surviving just the disease. And what that means is that uh, we are working towards developing newer techniques and newer tra treat, uh, treatments to improve the quality of life of breast cancer patients and survivors. Um, and as my colleague previously mentioned, for women, um, the uh, image of
and eventually their quality of life. And as uh, my colleague previously pointed out, uh, cancers uh, can occur also in very young patients and uh, women who are of childbearing and you know marriageable ages. And when that happens, if the, the breast is very scarred and um, uh, you know the recovery is um, results in some kind of uh, body you know uh, image concerns, it can really affect their self-esteem and their willingness to you know carry on and live well. So um, because of um, a new technique and, and uh, improvement in surgical approaches, you know, we're very lucky that um, now more increasingly women are enjoying improved quality of life and bring attention to two celebrities uh, in Singapore who have battled uh, breast cancer and uh, Ko Chik Man as well as Pan Ding Ding. And both of them are, you know, are very good examples of uh, survivors of breast cancer who are thriving. And of course, we all know uh, the very well-known actress, Hollywood actress, um, Angelina Jolie, whom herself did not have breast cancer, but her mother passed away of breast cancer and she actually had the gene for breast cancer. So she brought a lot of awareness to this um, uh, genetic uh, risk factor for breast cancer. And she herself underwent bilateral, what we call prophylactic mastectomy. So she removed both her breasts um, and reconstructed them with implants. Um, to reduce the chance uh, in this lifetime of getting breast cancer. And she too, you know, um, is thriving well and is a very uh, excellent uh, role model for, for women, especially if they are faced with this um, uh, challenge of breast cancer and dealing with it. So as my colleagues before me, uh, this will be a seem a little bit repetitive, but minimally invasive surgery basically means small incisions, uh, keyhole uh, surgery, which is a uh, very good news for plastic surgeons who are really all focused on um, the uh, final form and aesthetic um, function after surgery. Um, also good news for women because um, smaller scars means a better um, uh, you know, re uh, aesthetic uh, recovery. And then uh, as my colleagues mentioned before, we use um, cameras, you know, um, uh, small cameras that we put through these tiny incisions that allow us to visualize. And um, the Professor Emil mentioned that the difference between laparoscopic or so-called endoscopic options uh, in, in uh, MI, what we call minimally invasive surgery, versus the robot is the 3D view of um, the, the, the uh, projection on the cameras on the TV screen. However, even with endoscopic surgery, now we have 3D um, uh, uh, goggles that we can add on as an adjunct. So, you know, you still get the 3D vision um, either way. Um, and what overall in the literature, uh, minimally invasive surgery has been found to have uh, outcomes comparable to that of the conventional open surgery, and it's been found to be safe and feasible. So um, my colleagues all have kind of sort of shown you this before, um, and uh, just to show that we, this is how the robot works, you know, the surgeon sits in the console and um, the surgery happens uh, by the robot, robotic hands that we are able to control. And this is how we practice, um, actually. And uh, just bring your attention to here, where what I'm doing is basically practicing on dissecting small vessels. And my colleague, uh, Dr. Chu, mentioned that as plastic surgeons, what we do is we have to work with small blood vessels and finer things uh, during surgery. And the robot has precision. Um, it is very steady. There's no tremor. So it's actually a really good technology that has supported and helped us in our specialty. So the entire treatment of breast cancer is uh, beyond the scope of my talk today. But just to summarize, it includes surgery chemotherapy, targeted therapy, radiation, and hormonal therapy. And I focus on the surgery part. The breast cancer surgery itself, where we remove the breast um, along with what we call lymph nodes, because this is uh, often where the breast cancer or the first place where the breast cancer will spread. Um, that part of the surgery is done by my colleagues who are the breast cancer surgeons. And I come in to recreate or what we call reconstruct the breast. And when we do that, we reconstruct it either using the patient's own tissue, which comes either from the tummy, the buttock, or the back, or we can reconstruct it with an implant. And for the breast cancer surgery itself, there are two options, depending on the size of the tumor, the size of the patient's breast, and the location of the tumor. And you can either remove the whole breast or just remove the cancer uh, or the, uh, in the surrounding tissue around the cancer, what we call a lumpectomy 
and that is called breast conservation surgery. And again, um, all these evolution techniques from you know removing the whole breast to trying to conserve the breast as much as possible are all a result of um, uh, uh, us aspiring to ensure that these patients have um, as minimal scarring and improved um, quality of life after surgery. So for the reconstruction aspect, um, I mentioned before, either we would reconstruct with an implant. Uh, you can see that the, the breast tissue has been removed and behind it there's an implant sitting on the chest. Or we can use the patient's own tissue. And if we use their own tissue, the most common area we do, we take it from is the patient's tummy. Because a lot of uh, us women have a little bit of excess tissue there. But if we do that, we may need to connect uh, it to a blood supply in the chest. And therefore, we see the blood vessels here, we connect it up here. So um, minimally invasive uh, surgery in the form of either endoscope or robotic is also available to perform the same thing um, with smaller scars. Uh, and you can remove the whole breast with a smaller incision on the side. You can take off a portion of the breast where the cancer is um, uh, to a small incision on the side. And after, and you can do that using the endoscope or using the robot, and you can do the same surgeries as well with the robot. So why would you choose a uh, minimally invasive surgery or if it's so good with smaller scars, you know, wh why wouldn't you? So in terms of the advantages, um, as we keep mentioning, the smaller scars. So um, you've all heard of scarless breast lift or scarless breast augmentation. It doesn't mean that there's absolutely no scars. What it means is that when you look at the breast, you cannot see the scar, obviously. So now we've moved on to scarless breast reconstruction. And um, these are two uh, images to, uh, to show you that the scar can be hidden usually if you're using this approach um, on the side of the, the chest or either in the armpit area. Uh, again, depending on the uh, uh, size of the patient's uh, breast and the surgery that's being performed. And then so that when the patient recovers um, and after surgery uh, and looks and you look at the, at the chest from the front, you cannot see the scar. And as mentioned before, this surgery, uh, because of the smaller incisions, can lead to faster post-operative recovery time. So this is um, the main uh, reasons why we would want to consider this option for our patients. However, there's some limitations. It's not suitable for all patients. So patients who are very uh, have very large breasts um, or if uh, the tumor is very advanced, uh, then these are not good options for, for patients like that. Um, and because it's a smaller incision uh, and uh, it's a smaller space, it's more technically challenging. The time that we take during surgery is a little longer. As my colleagues mentioned before, uh, there's a lot of advanced uh, technology and equipment being used, so it's more expensive. And sometimes when there's a complication during this type of surgery, it might be a little harder to, to um, attend to it. For example, if there's some bleeding within a small space and we only have a little bit of access, this can um, uh, make it more difficult for us to, to, to um, stop it. or to and, and therefore, we may end up having to convert or revert back to the original open surgery. So all the things that I mentioned before have been uh, discussed in um, our website and it's um, been uh, uh, talked about as well in the Straits Times. So for any of you who are looking for more information on this, you know, please feel free to put this up. Um, the future, my colleague mentioned before uh, that we have newer robots with very, very, very small, we're getting smaller and smaller. And this allows us to address, as mentioned before, um, plastic surgeons want to, we need to work on small vessels and small um, uh, um, areas. And um, lymphatic, uh, lymphedema is actually one of the areas uh, where patients can develop um, after surgery because of removal of the lymph nodes in the armpit. So this removal of in, uh, 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 lymph nodes that uh, comes with breast cancer surgery can impact the flow of what we call lymph uh, through these lymphatic vessels that are actually in our body. And this re results in swelling, uh, which can be quite uh, you know, disfiguring and, and, and frustrating for patients. And this can actually be corrected by, by reconnecting these very, very tiny uh, lymphatic vessels. And quite uh, which used to be a technically uh, challenging uh, when we use our own uh, we, we can use it with instruments and hand sewing, but it's, it's quite challenging. So now we have um, you know, newer technology and robotic technology that can help uh, improve or make it uh, smoother and faster for, for us to do this. 
So um, in conclusion, quality of life for um, breast cancer survivors is extremely important for all cancer patients. Uh, minimally invasive surgical approaches for breast cancer and reconstruction continue to evolve as the technology advances. It's feasible, it's safe, it has comparable outcomes to open surgery in select patients. So for that, uh, uh, with that, I thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, you know, feel free to email me or we can address them now in the forum. Thank you, Dr. Savita, and uh, very important too. Right? Now, um, I think we are coming to the, the uh, towards the end of the session, but I think I want this to be an interactive one. So we have some questions online, but um, for those who have um, taken your time to come here physically, we have provided you with some lunch. And there are bento boxes. We have more than enough. So you can take home some for your family. But uh, maybe after our Q&A. And also, uh, we, for those who want to stay until the end, we have a quiz. We want to reward those of you who have been loyally listening in. Uh, so we have a top prize of three prizes of $20 of grab vouchers. I'm sure everyone knows how to use grab vouchers, right? You can use it for food. For your transport, yeah, and the uh, food at the back, uh, please consume it within four hours. Don't eat tomorrow, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, maybe we can have questions first, or do we want to do quiz first? Okay, I think everyone wants to do the quiz first, so let's uh, start. Does anyone know how to use a uh, QR code? This is not a scam, okay? Maybe that you can take me. You cannot see it, you can come out in front or get zoomed in and you can just click on this. Once you are got in, I think you've got to be the task or the um, and we can start the question. Please come in with your name so that for those that have phones and machines, you want to be able to send to my video, you don't have to come down and collect. Okay, so I can see that every picture of the car, she is in the car. Thank you for all the thumbs up and the uh, emojis. Okay, so uh, a bit challenging this question. So the answer is no. So we don't want you to go home thinking that keyhole surgery is suitable for everybody. Uh, so if the tumor is too big or it's not safe to do keyhole surgery, we need to go in and do the traditional type of surgery so that we remove all the cancer cells. Yeah. So for women with advanced cancers, for example, uh, we want to make sure we remove all cancer cells. If, if you leave even one cell behind, potentially it can come back. Uh, so the less you leave behind, the better your outcome. Okay, so that's the first question. Second question. Okay, Jen scored the highest by the three points in each other. And I thought, okay. Okay, so we just come to the The third question is probably quite fast. Okay, that's a good one. Oh, that's the last question. I'm so sorry. So we need to start with question number one. I'm very sorry. 
So do they need to log in again? So that was the part of this description. So we have all the different skills. Okay, let's go to the all three of them. Uh, and you can press this button. We're loading under this Okay, question one of ten. Is robotic or minimally invasive keyhole surgery safer than conventional surgery? Is it safer than open surgery? Yes or no? Safer meaning less likely to have problems, wound breakdown. Yeah. Ah, okay. Most of you got it correct. This, this is supposed to be the easy one. Uh. Okay, next question. If you're ready. Okay, JT has the highest cost followed by Jen. Okay. Next one, two, question two. Is there shorter hospitalization stay using robotic technology? Meaning robotic keyhole surgery with small, smaller cuts with uh, with uh, less pain. Is, is there gonna be shorter hospitalization? Answer is yes, this is quite obvious, huh? You don't need the answer. Then how do I go to the next one? Okay, next one. <coughs> oh, that's is talking the longest trip. Very good. Next. Question 3. This question with, uh, okay. Is robotic surgery suitable for everyone? Is it for everybody? Yeah, answer is no, correct. So, although we want to tell you that this new technology, there will be cases where there's no choice. Sometimes tumor is very big, you know, there's no point putting keyhole because you cannot take out the tumor. So answer is for early cancers, people who come and detect their cancers early. Okay, good. Question number four. Quite easy lah. Huh? So now it's about who's fastest, basically. Is surgery time shorter by using robot technology? Is it shorter meaning can the surgeon operate faster? Can the surgeon um, sort of like save on complications? Uh, answer is yes. Okay, quite straightforward. Okay, so YP has, has uh, picked up the pace. Question 5 Will robotic surgery leave a smaller scar? Faster if I choose robotic surgery. Okay, so but I want to tell everyone, you know, only if you qualify for robotic surgery. But the more difficult one is to apply, huh? Okay, it's a very close race. Is robotic surgery available in SGH? This is such a good question. Oh my God. I don't know who's going to answer this. Yay, good. I don't know what the other person is thinking, but yes, it's available, okay? It's just not suitable for everyone. Okay, question number eight. It's colorectal cancer, the top cancer affecting men in Singapore. Colon cancer, and colon, rectum, large intestine, these are all colorectal cancers. And Professor Emil Tan, he's a colorectal cancer surgeon. Ah, uh, okay, good. So, um, for women, breast can be highest. Men is actually colon. Uh, uh. Okay. Question number nine is breast cancer the top cancer affecting women? I just gave you the answer. <laughs> affecting women in Singapore, answer is so. In terms of percentage of cancer, yes, breast cancer is actually not. Uh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. <laughs> but breast cancer actually is very treatable when diagnosed early. 
it is one of the you know, least dangerous cancers we have. Last question, okay. Minimally, if it is surgery for a okay, this one is the It's not okay. It's not a free question to everyone. It's PSLE level. So difficult. My daughter is in the PSLE, so I'm very stressed. Okay, great. Okay, so we have uh, three winners, right? So, uh, Lai, Ron Fang, SH, and Awi. Anyone in the audience? Ah, okay. Excellent. Congratulations, sir. You win the grab voucher and you have food. <laughs> so, for those uh, uh, from Awi and SH, right? Please reach out to us on via email. I think in the Twitter will send the email and please tell us your phone number so that we can. And then uh, we talk to you and, and do a verification. Um, is there any questions? If not, there are some Q and A's online. Um, for those who are here, please go and help yourself for the food. Um, if you want to sit down and listen some more for the pre Q and A, we can discuss some more. You can also ask here live. But please go and enjoy the food. There are some refreshments. There's some dessert. Okay, so we have answered the first, second, then Q and A. Then you can log or you can have the option. For those at home, you know, they don't have any food to enjoy, so we must uh, not waste their time. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, for a we have to your silence. Okay, so uh, the first question we have answered uh, by Sia. Andrew Lim says, uh, is this knowledge of robotics and is equipment only available at SGH and not at other restructured hospitals? Answer is no. This is available in many hospitals in Singapore, chiefly the three major hospitals, which is Tan Tok Seng, NUH, SGH. Changi also recently got a robot, and places like Sengkang, they are getting their own robot technology as we see that it benefits more and more patients. Even in private practice, okay, so for full disclosure, there is a strong private practice presence for robotic surgery. And my good friend, Dr. Marco, he's a plastic surgeon who does robotic surgery, a lot of the colorectal surgeons, because private patients usually they, they have uh, their own funds, they, they are willing to pay, so they do have uh, a robotic uh, facility. So has it been used for spinal surgeries? Answer is yes, but not the Da Vinci. The Da Vinci that we explained to you is for tummy surgery, that means whatever is internal organ. So the spine, we have micro surgery, and more recently, we are the first in Asian country to have the microsurgical robot. So your old surgeon will have no problem doing the spine surgery without handshaking and injuring your spine. So we hope that with this awareness, we can then have more safer surgeries with, uh, by more experienced surgeons. And even younger surgeons, when they train, when they, they are shaking, you know, this can eliminate all the tremors. So I hope that answers your question. So spine surgery is very risky. It's very major surgery. You need to make sure uh, you get a good surgeon uh, and good equipment. So I just went through thyroid surgery at SGH and as a scar of 15 cm. Wondering why the robotic surgery was not offered to me. Yes, I'm very, very sorry. We do offer robotic thyroid surgery, but sometimes if your thyroid lump is very big, if there are cancer cells that we are worried that may spread elsewhere, we don't want to be operating from your armpit and then the cancer cell go to your armpit, for example. So there are a few considerations. If your cancer is early, it's well located inside the thyroid gland, very deep in. And then you, of course, you must ask us, right, whether or not there's any other option. Your surgeon will tell you, we as doctors, we don't want, we are someone, we are, we are working in public hospital. So we are also aware of costs involved. Doing a robotic uh, surgery adds on a few thousand dollars, depending on the type of surgery. Sometimes government don't subsidize. That means you have to come up with your cash money to do the robot surgery. And robot surgery, unfortunately, also takes a bit longer because you know you have to slowly come from the armpit, go to the thyroid, for example, as opposed to going from the neck. So I know scar is a big problem and I've seen enough scars as a plastic surgeon, but don't worry, help is at hand. Most scars will look great, angry, itchy, painful for the first three to four months. 80% of people with this cast, they settle down with time. After a few years, usually you, you do see a mark, but it won't give you too much trouble unless 
you have the very unlucky 5% who develop what we call a keloid scar. So keloid scars are what people say like looks like caterpillar. It pops out of the skin, it looks very ugly, uh, and it tends to grow. So those kind you need to come for treatment. We have a laser and scar center in all the ma major hospitals under Sing Health, SGH, KK, uh, Sengkang Hospital, even Changi Hospital. We have facilities that we can use to help treat scar. Now, scar treatment can also be a medical subsidized scar provided it is troubling, it is painful, it is uncomfortable. So I treat a lot of scars from people who go for thyroid surgery. So please don't lose hope. Okay, how to reduce scar and wrinkle tissue after surgery? So yes, this is standard. Anyone who has a scar, you must make sure you rest according to what your doctor tells you to. Yeah, so that means don't run around too much. Don't go, you know, Singaporeans like to work, not to go back to work, right? So they always ask me, when can I go back to work? My answer is, when you feel good enough, don't go back to work when you see a pain, discomfort, and then the wound breaks down, and then your scar will be, will be very bad. Uh, so of course, Singapore is also very hot. If there is very strong sunlight, avoid going out because your scar will turn brown, especially on the face, on the hand, any part of your exposed body, right? And then, of course, eat healthy. Make sure you eat healthy with a balanced diet, vitamin C, fibers, after major surgery. Don't go and eat KFC every day, yeah? So is it possible for delayed breast reconstruction surgery, meaning mastectomy was done one, two years before Dr. Savita? You can answer this question. Okay, um, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, unfortunately for delayed reconstruction, because the scar is already there and probably quite wide, um, we probably would not um, offer minimally invasive surgery for delayed reconstruction. Um, and I just want to, to sort of uh, qualify that this forum, we're talking about uh, awareness and, and uh, creating some awareness and, and, and bringing it to the public's attention that this is an option, but it's not the gold standard or mainstay of treatment uh, yet. Um, but probably maybe eventually in, in the future. Um, and it's for select patients. Uh. Um, so thank you for your question, but fortunately for delayed reconstruction because of the scar that's already there, that's already quite large, it would not make uh, much um, difference if we use a minimally invasive approach. Well, the question is basically for delayed breast reconstruction. So the answer is minimally invasive, a bit harder, yes. right? But it is possible to make a new breast. And I have patients from around the region like Taiwan, Hong Kong, Japan. These countries, right, the government don't subsidize reconstruction. Singapore government, we are much more uh, advanced thinking. So for ladies who have breast cancer, definitely, even though the plastic surgeon do the surgery for you, government will come up with subsidy. You can choose C-class. Even nipple reconstruction, say for example, in the cancer, surgery, we remove the nipple. When we do nipple reconstruction, nipple tattooing, it will still be subsidized. So for those of you who have suffered mastectomy, I know how hard it can be because your social life is gone. You can't go swimming. One of my patients the other day came to tell me I had put in a fake uh, implant, you know, where I put a bra insert, but whenever I go on to the bus and I do this, you know, I hold on to the railing, my hand comes down, then it remains up there. It looks very, very strange. And there are, a lot of them get very distressed. A lot of times, surgeons, right, will tell the patient, why are you so vain? You know, this is a, a non-functional breast. You know, you're how old already? Cancer is important. What do you think about reconstruction? But nowadays, we are listening to our patients more and more, right? It's not just about whether or not you treat cancer. It's whether or not you suffer mentally from the cancer. So for a lady who is able to go back home without having one side of the chest completely flat and ugly, I think that is a big win for most women. And it doesn't matter because the oldest patient I have is 68 years old. And she say, I don't want to go through life uh, looking incomplete. So if I'm healthy enough, if I can undergo the surgery, please doctor, can you help? So we do try and help, okay? So a lot of times it's a conversation between you and the doctor. So if the doctor is very busy, sometimes, you know, um, some of us is, are so busy that we just want to do so much, right? So it, sometimes you have to push the doctor and say, oh, you need to explain to me what are my choices. Because right now, Singapore law says every doctor, when you counsel your patient, you must give them all the choices there is. Okay, even those that you don't think the patient would choose. So I spend time talking to my patient. You need to sit down, 
you need to let them work through their emotion because when you have cancer, you can't even think straight, right? You want someone to tell you, hey, there's this A, B, C choice. So in other words, mastectomy is very, very debilitating, but there is help, okay? I apologize for some of the AV issues um, and the music was a bit loud. We'll try and change it next time. Okay, um, this is a very technical question. The second last question is, could the robotic arm able to control the pressure on the tissue while surgery? That means, can I feel the tissue when I'm doing surgery, right? Whether it's heart tissue, soft tissue. So the good news is the technology that we have here is, is fourth generation robot. So the robot will feel the, the tissue and it will transmit to the controller. So when I want to push, I can feel the resistance. So this is what we call a force feedback. So it is very advanced, much more advanced than your PlayStation and your Xbox, right? So um, this is for medical use. That is why the cost is so much expense, so much more expensive, you know. Most of patients, um, they have to pay up to 6000 but generally about two three thousand 3000 depending on the complexity. So, uh, sometimes that is the part where we cannot overcome. And right now, because government also wants to try and keep costs of everyone's healthcare low. So, you know, if there's an alternative, of course they do alternative. But again, patients are at the heart of what we want to do. So when they tell us, hey, I'm very worried about the cut, about the, you know, I'm staying alone, my children are overseas, I really want something that I won't have to be a burden to my family. So in that kind of situation, you need to have that conversation and think of ways, you know. And sometimes if there is increased acceptance of the surgery, uh, the government will understand and then they will try and help. So I'm not from the government, of course, so please don't think that uh, this is anything related to the voting. Yeah, But yeah, I, I feel that Singapore got, in Singapore, we, we are well-funded, we are a resource-rich country. And sometimes um, you, you need to know your rights and, and ask the doctor. So last question, what is the cream to reduce on scar, for example, bio-oil? Dr. Savita, you want to take this? Since you treat young children and women, what is the treatment for scar? What is the cream that we use? I, I, I think that there are many creams that the answer is that there are many scar um, creams available in the market. Um, I don't think that uh, because we have, we, as doctors, we are neutral, um, in the, so there's a whole range. We just uh, recommend um, something that's silicone based uh, because that has been shown in the um, uh, with, with scientific uh, uh, evidence that any silicone is actually a component that helps with scarring and reduce the thickening of the scarring. So um, we don't, I don't favor any particular brand. In uh, it varies from institution to institution. Uh, common brands would be, um, you know, com common uh, scar gels would be. Like, like was mentioned here, bio oil. There's uh, things like Dermatix, um, Pinocot. So I would say that uh, there are many uh, scar creams in the market, and each one, uh, each institution will use may use a different type. But um, the important is the component, uh, which usually is vitamin A, C, or E, which helps um uh, scar um recovery as well as silicone that prevents the scar from thickening. Yep, thank you very much, Dr. Savita. So basically, any scar, right? Basically, surgical scar, traumatic scar, most of the time it will heal after about six months. So if you have scars that are very, very um uh, distressing, for example, scar of the face, you know, or a young child with a scar. So generally speaking, take care of the wound, right? Bring lots of water, make sure the wound don't don't become too dry. Eat vitamin C. Vitamin C helps uh you know, reduce the, 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 the inflammation and help collagen building. And most hospitals will give silicone-based scars. Silicone can be either ointment, that means cream, or physical tapes. So ask your doctor, okay? Because most scars will heal, so most doctors will tell you, ah, don't bother, don't worry, you know? So that is not wrong, but you must monitor yourself. If the scar becomes redder, more angry looking, pops up through the skin and feels itchy, painful, then you need to do something about it. So scar cream can only help to reduce, but once it grows into a big scar, you do need to address that big scar. So when you come and see us in our laser and scar center, we offer things like laser treatment, injection treatment. Um, scars that we give priority to are scars that have problems with function. 
So for example, hand scars, you know, you can't use your hand properly, then those will definitely give priority. Treat them medically, and you can even help have insurance and MediSafe to cover those kind of bad scars. So I hope that answers that question. Now, in the audience, is there, is there any questions? Uh, any pressing question? I see someone raising your hand, sir. Maybe you're asking on the internet. So please feel free to uh, go to the back and proceed to have your lunch. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Same for birds. Uh, uh, they say that uh, they replacement. Mm. Uh, despite not being exposed to sun, the scar kind of a brownish. You did say the scar, if it's exposed to sun, but this is not the case. Uh, it's not of importance, but then how do you sort of like lighten or sort of like reduce the scars? Aesthetic wise. Yeah, so before you understand why a scar turned brown, I mean, uh, basically, ultraviolet light, right, is only one part of the equation. Uh, so strong UV light, which your eyes cannot see actually will cause browning of the scar, you know. But other things like inflammation, uh, so if you have diabetes, usually the scar tends to turn a bit darker. Uh, if you're prone to it, some individuals, their skin is a bit darker, they do get tend to get darker scar. But the good news is, even this color will fade with time. Uh, so to me, most people who undergo knee replacement, although the scar is long, it may turn brown, but you know, most of the time you go out, covering your knee so it's not so big of, of a problem but if you do find that this is disturbing you you know somehow you feel very embarrassed there are creams that you can use so one of the creams that we use is called hydroquinone um, unfortunately this uh, pigmentation cream uh, when we prescribe is not covered by subsidy from the government so it costs about 160 per bottle um, and you need to use it at least for six weeks to see any effect uh, there are also other things like lasers. So pigmentation lasers are what we use for ladies who are aging for pigmentation of the face. These lasers can also be used for scar. But unfortunately, those are not subsidized by the government. The cost, if you go um, to SGH, is about four to 600 It can vary between institutions. Uh, so I, I usually tell my patients to be patient. Uh, I'll wait one, two years. After all, the knee surgery is very important, right? So the scar is a small change. Even the knee replacement nowadays, they have the smaller scar surgery. Uh, so we can look forward to a better outcome for my patient, for our patients. Um, and, but if for any reason, if you feel a lot of discomfort from the scar, please come and see us. Uh, the silicone gel that you buy from the, uh, from the Guardian Pharmacy can help prevent, but it doesn't help the color of the scar. So a lot of that, it, it depends on, on your own genetic predisposition to, 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 uh, to the discoloration. And even non-direct sunlight from the window, for example, uh, UV light can penetrate through skin, especially Singapore, our UV index is 13, 14. Most countries in the Europe is only 8, 7, even in summer. So you can understand why we always tell you to cover, cover, cover. Even if you wear... I, even recommend you know physical cover or sunscreen you know and, and if you go swimming a lot of times people think oh swimming the water is so cool right that means no sunlight but actually it's not true you're cool but the uv light still comes in and that can still cause you to develop pigmentation okay so waterproof sunscreen is something you can try but uh whatever it is i don't want you to sit at home and don't do anything you know, if you had, had the knee replacement surgery, your orthopedic surgeon will say you must start walking, you must start exercising so that you don't get stiffness. Uh, so there is a balance. Lah. So maybe evening walks. Okay. So anyone else? Any questions? Any uh, even unrelated questions? I think if you want to ask. If not, I think it's 11.23. Ah, okay. One last question. How effective is laser treatment of pigmentation? It depends on what is the cause of the pigmentation. So a lot of the ladies who are postmenopausal, they start developing what we call melasma. So this is completely unrelated to robotic surgery and cancer. Okay, so laser treatment is something that um, uh, is very common in the market. Any of the cosmetic GP doctors you see outside will have the laser treatment, but I must tell you, no treatment is hundred percent. Most of the time, you can. You can look forward to a bit of reduction. 
I would tell my patient most effective is about 50-60% reduction. It is impossible to get 100%. So sometimes a lot of the uh, private sectors will tell you, oh, let's sign up a package, right? Six session, eight session, 10 session, cheaper. But the more you do, I find the less effective the laser is because the lighter the, the pigmentation is, the less effective the laser becomes. You know, for very dark pigments, yes, you can get 50% 50 redu 50 reduction. But once you reach 20%, then it's very hard to do less and less until it's completely normal. So I, I, don't, I don't push laser pigmentation treatment, um, but um, uh, that's something you need to think about. Okay, Please mention about scar tissue. Okay, we just mentioned about scar tissue. So maybe you want to talk more about scar tissue, right? So scar tissue is something that is um, uh, very difficult to treat. No one can promise you no scar, okay? Nobody. If someone comes and tell you, oh, there will be no scar after surgery, then it's lying. Because every one of us, even when we are born, have one scar. What is that scar? Belly button, right? So can anyone's belly button disappear? Impossible. So that's your answer here. Uh, there's no, it's not possible to remove all scar. And sometimes, uh, a lot of times, I sit down and I talk to patients, especially... If your scar is not disturbing you too much, you know, uh, you, you just have to uh, let it let it go. Uh. Okay, what are treatments for skin tags? Should see plastic or derma? Either one. Any doctors can help you remove skin tag. You know, if it's a small skin tag, you can just put a bit of local anesthetic and, and just cut away the skin tag. Skin tags can be problematic when you reach older age, 60, 70 years old. Usually on the neck, on the armpit, uh, on the groin, so these, these areas, sometimes it can also be associated with conditions such as diabetes. So don't ignore if you have symptoms, you know, of diabetes. So you need to get it treated. Skin tag is basically a very simple out arching of your skin. Uh, so this is simple surgery. Anyone can do. But of course, if you're worried about the scar, yes, do see a plastic surgeon, do see a dermatologist. But most GPs will be able to help you. Nowadays, you can even use carbon dioxide laser to laser off these very small skin tags. Okay. Yeah, so it's uh, 11.30. So I think we can call this session to an end. If anyone wish to ask any question in particular, please approach me or Dr. Sarita. We will flash the email. So let's flash the email here. And uh, whoever needs to ask. Yeah. So, okay, so uh, thank you for the last comment. Will, will there be a rerun for those who missed? <laughs> I guess we can plan, yeah. But so keep keep uh um keep us in your mind and 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 we will reach out whenever there is. Will people have fair compassion and doctor or like this? Yes. So people with fair compassion will have more prominent scars, whereas people with darker skin will will have the scar less prominent. Basically, it's just a contrast, la. So it doesn't mean that you have fair compassion means you have darker or lighter. It doesn't really hold any uh water. But any scar that breaks down, that is not healed properly, will tend to give you bad scar. So once you have any scar, please go and pay attention. Don't let it get infected. Huh? Especially animal bites. Uh, so animal bites, dog bites, cat bites, even human bites can have a lot of bacteria contaminating the wound. A lot of times people ignore it and then they come to us with very bad scars. By then it's too late. It's always better to prevent rather than to treat. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you very much, and please give a hand to everyone who shared. Thank you, I will take that up and we can try it. So, thank you for coming to this uh, place. This is an innovation center. I know it's harder to find, but please tell all your friends, and we will try and uh, uh, make more public forums. Huh? Thank you. Hey, thank you so much. So what's the link in Hydro? Hydro Queen on that. Uh the one you need. You need a dermatologist or plastic surgeon to give you the thickness which you It's the sound very bad. Alright,